two o'clock at night. So, uh, and there are lots of nice prezzies to take home. Fantastic architecture section opens at seven in the morning till two at night with great co cocktails. Um, our other project, another project we've done here in Tokyo, our favourite city, is Ginza Place, and you'll see this right on the, the you know the most important crossroads in Tokyo, which is in Ginza on the Yonchomei Crossing. It's the Sapporo building, it's a mixed-use project, but it's across the road from one of the most famous historic buildings in Japan, at the Wako building, which is the home of Seiko Watches, because Seiko was really born there. And being a Brit, being a bit traditional, we felt that we had to line our project through and really reflect um, the, uh, the, the scale and the, of the architecture. Um, this also came to the Olympic Olympics, so... So, we're very keen to have a balcony on the third floor, because there's so many people standing at the crossing, and if they can see a cafe on the balcony, you say, this is where I want to be. And especially when there is the Olympic parade, you want to wave to all the athletes. Okay. And where do you do that, other than the Ginza place? But I mean, the thing about working here in Tokyo, Astrid and I have been here for 30 years, 30, yeah, 30 years this year, Hisiyama san has been working with us for 20 years and more and this is the, the reason why we stay here because of the way things get built and the construction companies and also the traditions. Uh, this is putting in the last beam of the project of Ginza Place and the whole construction company and the architects sign the beam before it's lifted in, in, into place. Astrid went first and actually got quite a large uh, signature on there. But anyway, it, it is a really uh, lovely tradition. Japanese and modest. Japanese and modest and the foreigners are really Sorry, sorry. That was no good, but anyway. And as they put in the last, the last bolt, the last few bolts are golden. And I think that's really amazing too. So you can see there with the, with the red and white rope, which is also uh, a sign of uh, celebration here in Japan. But the gold bolts are really, really fantastic. So, not only is Tokyo our favourite city, but Bangkok has become our favourite city too. One of our favourite cities in Asia. And this is a project we've just finished here, uh, there, uh, called Open House. It's a big mixed-use living room. A little bit like Sataya, but with 14 restaurants. Um, and it basically opens all day. It's become a, a huge oasis uh, for the city. city, city. So, as, you, as you know, Bangkok is really, really hot, and people have nowhere to go outside. Mark just gets totally sweaty just thinking of it. Even in here. So uh, he's pretty much, uh, we're pretty, pretty much building this with Mark in mind. The traffic is not so good in Bangkok either. And uh, here we go. So that's our, that's our main job. So um, my job is, is running, is running for change at night. And, um, Pachanga means, as I say, I think I said it a little bit earlier, it's chick chang in Japanese, Pachanga, chang 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 And, um, yeah, it was a way that you know, we wanted to get young people to show and share their work in public. And we started this 15 years ago at the dawn of digital photography. Instead of putting slides in carousels, it's very easy uh, to put a presentation together in keynote. But you know what architects like, they talk too much. We also run an art, art space called Super Deluxe, and we had a few dead, dead nights. So we thought, could we find a way to mash those two together and have these uh, simple show and tells? Um, and as I said, you know, architects love talking about that handrail detail or the cladding detail. We want to kind of stop that getting into a rat hole. So 20 slides, 20 seconds, next person off. We had, we had our first event in 2003. Uh, we had 14 presenters and we've held the event every month now for 15 years. And we get three or 400 people every month, which is pretty amazing. Um, and we just fell on this number. 10 slides, 10 seconds was too short. 20, 20, 20, 20 vision. There was something very, very nice about that. Something in the advertising here. So the great thing is that we can also get people, the hidden heroes in a Sin City, to come and present. People who've never presented before. So this is a, 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 a construction worker who puts the scaffolding up on the, on the big, big, biggest bills in Tokyo. He'd never spoken before and um, off, off he went. So it started off as a one-off event in Tokyo and it's now spread unbelievably. We do not charge for the format, that's how it's spread. We are now in, as of today, 1,082 cities on this event. And many of you, I'm sure, have been to Pachacha Nights in your city. But it's been quite an incredible hit, uh, history this happening over 15 years. Yeah, I know there are lots of architects who uh, are kind of furthering the cause of architecture and, uh, you know, kind of making workshops 
tops and tops. So I think it's part of this altruistic character of architecture. You know, when so many people enjoy it, it just gets us out of bed. And so it's been running for 15 years. We're still getting 100 events a month happening uh, around the world, which is really great. So to, um, and it's actually 116 already uh, in, in September, which is really amazing. And it really is about creative people, architects, designers, young people who don't have a chance, young architects that don't have a chance to give a full-blown 90 minute lecture, but they do have 20 great photographs of their parents' house they've just built. We have over 13,000 presentations online. Um, and uh, we, our events are, can be very, very large, like tonight. Uh, Thank you for inviting us uh, to use the format. So here we are in Tel Aviv. Two thousand people uh, take to the stage. Two thousand people arrive into an aircraft hangar in Tel Aviv. They have it four times. It's eight thousand people. It's become the Matinee biggest event. Matinee and soiree over two days. Can you imagine presenting four times? No, no I don't think so. It's too tough. No, 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 no. But the most important thing is that the spaces like this in uh, Kampala in Uganda, all you need is a bed sheet. Maybe a man can somebody put them in the place. So that's the chat tonight, that's my kind of architecture, and we hope you all have a fantastic night tonight. We look forward to all the presenters talking about their favorite city. That's right, and therefore we want to welcome the first presenter, which is Tsuyoshi Tanesan. Maybe not. 
the architecture in Bhutan has been made for the specific people of traditional Bhutan houses. So all the places sizes and the window sizes and the materials and the also organization of the spaces has been defined in the Bhutan. So in order to control the environment, that they are not allowed to cut even tree from the national let's say uh, permission.
and it's very much shaped by the legacy of our golden age of 17th century, which is that concentric ring of canals, and that is what, what everyone knows and uh, loves about Amsterdam. And as we can see, it actually shaped also the development of Amsterdam in a very prolonged way, even far into the 20th century. This original shape, which is actually around the medieval core, still uh, dominated how Amsterdam spread out. And this image of a Japanese architect, I think, sums up what most of us love about Amsterdam. It's very mad, it's little and higgledy piggledy. Amsterdam shows that. But as many cities, we also face problems in Amsterdam too. We have now far too many visitors. Um, sometimes streets need to be even closed. We are in danger in becoming another Venice where actually no one lives anymore. I still live in the center, but that might change. So we, all of us here today, have part of the future of our favorite cities in our hands and the question is what what can we do as design professionals to safeguard uh, a healthy future for all our cities we uh, in US studio we try to distinguish some of the most important issues that, that, that fascinate us but that are also the real problem issues of our time such as mobility how does our food uh, is how is it produced it's to our city? And such issues, we think, can only be resolved by adopting an integral approach where we really also go along with new technology, but in an integral way, not being led by technology, but we as designers take technology in our hands. But not just technology. The collaborative um, uh, approach is very, also very important for us, <clears throat> as well as acknowledging a sort of humanity, humanism in architecture, even in the most contemporary situations. There should always be space for the individual to experience, uh, to play. We should not only think about values such as efficiency and economy, which are so dominant in today's architectural debate, even when we have to work on the massive scale that we often work in today. Let's try to find room for the individual. And we have taken an approach where we um, continuously try to be a learning organization and we invest a lot in that, in cultivating that's also a specific knowledge that we can then contribute to the future of our cities and so we, we try to become specialists in many topics, sort of generic specialists in everything related to architecture and the city. And not just is it about collecting the knowledge that we find um, <laughs> from our work, but also then disseminating it again and sharing it in um, <laughs> in, in today's open way. And we have these platforms that we can experience as threatening and that can um, threaten <clears throat> privacy, but we can also try to um, use them in a positive way. Where ultimately our goal is healthy places for everyone. And this is a, a very recent project that we have just embarked on in Melbourne. But back to my favorite city, maybe it is <clears throat> the dream of every architect to ultimately also. Um, be able to contribute to your own city. This is one of those problem areas of Amsterdam. It's the ring road around it, and it still follows that concentric circles of canals. But this is its reality today. So this is also Amsterdam and its 
rather a movie, but also generic plays that could be everywhere. And it is a challenge to us, and also a privilege that we can be put in the position to think about it uh, and be commissioned right now here for a study to think about what can a ring road look like in the future because mobility will change and that will change everything. And we envisage here hubs along that ring road that become centers for energy production, energy distribution, but also food production and distribution. This is not uh, anymore a, a dream or a, a utopian project. This is a project that is actually under construction in Amsterdam. And it, we, um, we here make a sort of a work campus, which is very open, which provides new ways of working. And lastly, another uh, little bit utopian project in Amsterdam, which partly would help resolve take the pressure of that center by engaging um, in new forms of transportation that are practical both for uh, everyday users but also for visitors. Thank you very much. units uh, which are you know for public housing and it's also got these little communal areas so even in high-rise living we try to create uh, areas of interaction and chance encounters and a uh, community building this too is a project it's a private property really but it's also quite public in the way that it actually lifted the ground plane and the ground plane then as you can see in the contours on this image and the next one starts to simulate a natural environment where you can actually walk through and continue uh, from that street so the public areas of, in this case, the Park Royal Hotel and also the dining areas would be on the ground floor and as you hit up and go upwards, we try to bring the gardens uh, into the sky as well. So these gardens really would then be visually accessible and would, co would basically contribute uh, towards, I suppose, visual relief and that makes everyone a little bit healthier as well. Another project, uh, also with Woha, is basically a part conservation project, so there are three uh, old buildings, we took away only the middle one, so to us that's a bit of a sustainable uh, uh, construction uh, method as well, and um, turned that really into a furniture showroom that then bleeds both into the old buildings on the left and on the right, therefore extending that furniture show space uh, into both the old and the new. 
Here's another project uh, with a different company, and um, it's an industrial building that's retrofitted to become an office uh, slash industrial building as well. So this used to be 10 stories. It looked um, sort of like a modern uh, building, and we basically expanded it and crafted new spaces and carved out, again, uh, new volumes and new spaces for interaction. Now, with Singapore, there is a limit in land, so um, how then do we continue building up and how then do we continue uh, pushing for new economies? And this is something that the Committee for the Future Economy in Singapore, which is a panel of experts that's been set up last year, has actually proposed uh, for Singapore. So that has a lot of implication on architects uh, like myself as well. We've talked about creating land in the sea. We've talked a little bit about high-rise buildings, right, which we see uh, everywhere. And we'll talk a little bit more about going underground. Well, literally. And press it. So what uh, we've, be, we've begun to do is start to digging underground. In this case, about 150 meters below sea level, where we store petrochemicals, therefore releasing the ground area for activity space and also for areas with uh, higher real estate value. And in this case, uh, a concept for an underground science city as well, where research labs and um, effectively we could function underground 150 meters right now and not even know it and also uh, images really of skyrise uh, plantations, skyrise gardens, parks, renewable energy uh, uh, sources and so on, where you could literally live in the sky, and it really could be the norm. Uh, I know that's really happening in Tokyo, of course, but uh, this really pushes the concept a little bit further. And with that, a little small project, right? So real shift in scale to a project that's only about 100 square meters, tiny box. This is a project um, that's called the Skylab. So it's a laboratory really for uh, building technologies. So you could plug and play the facades, the lighting, the air conditioning, and run some tests on it, right? So what these tests then do is inform you of how successful these technologies are with regards to environmental sustainability. The building also happens to rotate, right? So it's got this little uh, a rotational thing uh, as you move it along and it basically could also track the sun. So with more than 100 sensors, you could actually test out uh, how that building reacts uh, to its occupants and its people as well. So that takes the concept of um, smartness uh, into, in this case, a project which is the National University of Singapore Architecture Block, uh, which we're doing together with a few partners. Um, the new architecture building for NUS, the university. This is going to be the first zero energy institutional building in Southeast Asia. And what we've actually done is we've introduced new technologies such as um, if you run a fan in a room like this, you will still be thermally comfortable even if you don't jack up the air conditioning. So in doing so, we save uh, quite a bit on air conditioning bills. And whatever's left uh, for the students to actually use in terms of power will be offset with full solar panels. So really combining architecture in this case with um, engineering together with our uh, consultant partners, and that literally reduces uh, the energy consumption by more than 40%, right? Through optimal design in your facades and also introducing uh, tracking of how your usage is going to be with uh, all these simulations, of course. And the last slide, well, what do we then do uh, as architects with limited land, with limited space? We try to export uh, some of our, our expertise, uh, some of our capabilities, and in this case, a master plan of a smart city um, in another one of my favorite cities, which is Bangkok, right? So this is slightly north of Bangkok and introducing architecture, urbanism, and technology from Singapore. Thank you very much. We'll take a small break and uh, we'll see you here back in 10 minutes. We're running a little bit late, so um, bathrooms are over there, drinks are over there. And I think we're going to break the bread a bit later, is that correct? I don't know when it's going to happen, but... Uh, so, we, we were told... Okay, so we're going to be talking about... This space, this reading space is the most comfortable space. Next. Okay, next. Uh, some rooms for small children. Next. <laughs>
we are suffering from the big earthquake, big damages by earthquake, typhoons, and heavy rains. Nature is far beyond control for human beings. Next. Human beings should not try to conquer nature with technology, but instead should uh, create architecture that is blessed by nature. Next. Human beings are a part of nature. Architecture is also a part of nature. Before the modernism age, people, in, especially in Asia, believed this philosophy. Uh, next. This is our last picture. Uh, before modernism, the people, it's parallel with other animals, or plants, uh, everything was the same. We must remember our philosophy again. Thank you.